مرحبا يعطيكم العافية. Um, today's our lecture is about etiology of malocclusion. Um, it's ever going to be in two parts. This is the first part of the lecture. So as you know, um, we have um, malocclusion that um, affecting most of the population. As we can see here in this patient, um, she has a class 3 uh, malocclusion. Then we treat her into achieving a class 1 normal relationship. In order to correct malocclusion, we need to understand what is the etiology for this kind of malocclusion to be able to deliver the best treatment for the patient. As you covered in the previous two lectures, the etiology of malocclusion could be a skeletal factor, could be a soft tissue factor, or the last one, which is the lecture of today and next week, which is the dental or the lack local factors. So for example, this patient has a class 3 incisor relationship, and if you look closely to his extraoral photograph, you can see that he has a prognathic mandible that class 3 skeletal that result in this kind of malocclusion so here the etiology of this malocclusion is a skeletal if you look at this patient here she you can notice that she has an increased overjet uh, due to the proclination with upper incisors and if you look closely at the extra oral photograph you can see that she has a lip trap basically the lip is trapped behind the upper and lower incisors resulting in proclination of the upper incisors and retroclination of the lower incisors with increased overjet as a result. And here, the etiology for this kind of malocclusion is soft tissue. And that should be covered in the previous two lectures. Now, the third one, which is the topic of this lecture, is the local, or what we call it, the dental factor. So we can divide the local factors into variation on tooth number, teeth of odd size, variation in tooth position and the last one is retained primary tooth for this lecture we're going to talk about the variation in the tooth number while the rest of these topics will be covered in the next lecture so let's go with the variation in the tooth number so when we say variation in tooth number it covers three topics the first one supernumerary which basically an extra tooth or hypodontia which basically a missing teeth or a tooth and the last one is an early loss of primary tooth. So talking about the supernumerary teeth now is the one that's defined as the one that is additional to the normal series of teeth. So we have an extra tooth. Most commonly it affects the anterior maxilla. It is more common on males than on females. Now the classification of the supernumerary can be classified according to the morphology into four types, conical, tuberculate, supplemental, and odontal. However, there is another classification that is according to the location. So basically, if the supernumerary in the anterior part of the maxilla, the premaxilla, we call it mesodense. It's near the premolar, we call it the parapremolar. If it's next to the molars, we call it paramolars. And if it's distal to the last molar, we call it distomolar. So this, this classification is according to the location, while the classification we see here on the screen is according to the morphology. So start with the first one, it's called conical. And as the, the name implies, the shape of this kind of the supernumerary is conical in shape. Usually, these teeth have a crown and a root, and usually it's inverted. And sometimes, as in this photograph, it erupts to the oral cavity. The most important part that these kind of supernumerary usually, but not always, will result in spacing, as we can see in this photograph, resulted in median kind of median diastema, or when it erupts to the oral cavity, it can cause crowding. But in most of the cases, they don't cause any problem, and sometimes we diagnose them by chance when we take a radiograph. Having said all of that, there is sometimes an instance that this kind of supernumerary cause impaction of the incisors, they prevent them from eruption. However, this one is rare in this kind of uh, supernumerary. Mostly, the conical supernumerary will uh, cause median diastema, displacement, or not to cause any problem. As you can see in this anterior occlusal radiograph, these are the supernumerary uh, conical one. It has a crown, underdeveloped root, it's inverted, and it's erupted, it's impacted without causing any problems for the incisors. 
not displacement, not an impaction, and these ones were diagnosed by chance when you take a radiograph and you see these kind of supernumerary. The second type of the supernumerary is the conical one, and the conical one is the one that causes impaction most commonly. The shape of the conical one, usually it comes in pairs, that is two of them as you can see, and usually they are the parallel shape and they develop in the lingual surface of the upper incisors. And they mostly cause impaction of the incisors, they prevent the incisors from eruption, as you can see here in the radiograph. So, if we compare the conical to the tuberculate, we can notice that the conical does not cause as many troubles as the tuberculate. The other one, oh, looking at this photograph, you can notice that we have lateral incisors, then <coughs> primary incisors, then central incisors. And here, the, the lateral incisors should erupt after the central incisors, which means that now by erupting before, that we have a change in the sequence of eruption. And whenever we have a change in the sequence of eruption, we have to expect that we have a problem. For that reason, uh, we took this radiograph and we noticed that the incisors are impacted with a tuberculate supernumerary. The third type is supplemental. So basically, it's copy and paste. It's a twins. It's a tooth that exactly similar to the, uh, the two teeth that are exactly similar to each, each other. And usually the management for this kind of malocclusion, if we, have, we don't have enough space for both of them, we extract one of these teeth because usually they cause crowding. However, it's rarely to cause impaction. Usually they erupt the oral cavity and cause crowding rather than impaction because they look as a normal tooth. The last one is the odontome. So basically it's a mass of uh, of uh, radio opacity, it kind of have two types, either complex or compound. The complex one, it's uniform radio opacity, as we can see in the photograph, radiograph on the left, while the compound one, it's made of small denticles. Complex and compound, that's what I said, two types of the odontome. The compound one is made of discrete denticles, while the complex one is one mass of dentine and pulp and enamel. One third of the compound odontome and, with one, one and half of the complex odontome prevent eruption of the teeth. So basically, if you see a complex uh, odontome, you expect impaction because it's a 50-50 chance. Why one third of the compound, they cause impaction, so it's less often. However, the compound odontome are far more common than the complex odontome. So that's clearly you that compound having a higher chance of causing problems compared to the complex one. This table that you have to memorize, it's going to summarize what we said about the conical, tuberculate, and supplemental kind of supernumerary. So when you have a supernumerary tooth, you might expect delay or delay in the eruption of the permanent teeth, as we can see in the top photograph, that the central incisor should erupt, but they did not erupt. So that's delayed eruption, because the sequence of eruption has changed. So these are signs of supernumerary. A asymmetrical eruption pattern beyond the normal age. So basically, usually what we have is the, the, if one central incisor erupted on the right side, for example, the left one should erupt within six months, maximum six to nine months. But if we have a supernumerary only on one side, so you expect the left central incisor, for example, to erupt, while the impacted one due to the, center, the supernumerary on the right side to stay impacted and erupted. And here we get asymmetrical pattern of eruption. We usually, the patient, uh, the, the contralateral tooth should, should erupt within six to nine months. We start to be worried if it's one year and the contralateral has not erupted. Sometimes the supernumerary causes spacing, but not the conical one, the tuberculate one. It's the conical one. And as you can see in the bottom photograph here, if this supernumerary did not erupt to the oral cavity, it will prevent the two central incisors from closing the median diastema. So this patient will have a median diastema, and whenever you have a patient with median diastema, you have to take a radiograph to make sure that there is no supernumerary preventing the closure of the median diastema. 
Sometimes the supernumerary will erupt into the oral cavity, as we can see in this photograph. And sometimes they don't cause a problem, but sometimes if it's a crowded us, they increase the severity of crowding. Or if it's well aligned us, they just make it crowded us. So that is it regarding the supernumerary as an etiology of the malocclusion. The second variation is the hypotonsia, which is missing teeth. Okay. So as you can see here in this photograph, you can see that the patient has two central incisors, but he does not have lateral incisors. And as you can see, as a result, we have a median diastema and he's spacing the upper arch. Um, however, usually in the patient with hypotonsia, we usually have microtonsia, and that's going to be in variation in the teeth size. We're going to talk about it next uh, lecture. So you can see that the patient has a generalized spacing in the upper and lower arch. The cause of that because the teeth are smaller than the size of the jaw and we have a missing lateral incisors. However, sometimes missing lateral incisors will not result in this huge amount of spacing. As you can see in this patient here, we have a missing lateral incisor. We have just mild spacing. And, and the cause of that, it depends on the size of the teeth. If the size of the teeth is affected as well as the previous photograph, we can have spacing. If the size of the teeth is bigger than the size of the jaw, Missing lateral incisors can kind of solving the problem, as in this case. So if the lateral incisors are here, we're going to have severe crowding because there is no enough space for these lateral incisors. Okay. So, hypodontia can affect one or more teeth. Most commonly, it affects the wisdom. And after that, the lateral incisor, sorry, the, after that is the second premolar in the lower arch, then lateral incisors in the upper arch, then the lower central incisors in the lower arch. So start with the missing upper lateral incisors. So usually we have a bilateral missing lateral incisors, or sometimes we have a missing lateral incisor on one side and a big shaped lateral incisor on the other side. Now, missing lateral incisors will result in spacing, as you can see in all the photographs that we say so. And this this spacing is kind of either mild, or sometimes it go to a moderate spacing if the patient have a hypodontia has hypodontia uh, microdontia as well. Other than a spacing, we can have the appearance and the aesthetic because the canine sometimes, if we have a missing cell lateral incisor, as we can see in this photograph, they're gonna take the place of the lateral incisors. So basically, they might appear as like a vampire. No one would like the canine to be in the place of the lateral incisors. For that reason, we have to provide treatment, and we're going to discuss that later during the this year and next year, how to manage a missing lateral incisors. Now, if you can see on this radiograph, the canine, use, it's a theory. It's called the guidance theory. What this theory say? that the canine will use the distal side of the upper lateral incisors as a guidance to erupt to its normal position. So whenever you don't have a lateral incisor and a big shaped lateral incisors, you can, the canine will lose their way and they become impacted as we can see in this photograph. Having said that, it does not mean that every uh, missing or la uh, big shaped lateral incisor will result in an impacted canine. No, but the thing is that this theory came up after they did um, a survey and they noticed that the patient who has a hypodontia, they are highly likely to have an impacted canine. So they came up with a guidance theory, which is a, a, a valid theory, but that does not mean every missing lateral incisor will have an impacted canine. Now, the missing lower premolar, it will result in a retained deciduous second primary molar. And sometimes, as a result of that, because we don't have a permanent successor that causes resorption, the E will have an ankylosis with the bone that will result in the, we call it the infraocclusal primary molar. So basically, what's happened is the tooth become ankylosed. Everything else surrounding the tooth will grow vertically, while the E will stay as it is. It will not grow anymore vertically. And as a result, it will appear as if it is sinking. But basically what's happening is that the neighboring structure are growing up. Um, we're going to have a separate lecture about what is the management of uh, missing lateral incisors, missing, sorry, um, 
second uh, premolar. Missing lower central incisors as well, it happened, and it's most commonly seen in the Asian population, more than the Caucasian one. As you can see in this photograph, this is first central incisors, central incisors, and lateral. Uh, usually, we don't know exactly whether it's a missing central or a missing lateral uh, because they look similar to each other. However, we usually just refer to them as a missing central incisor. Uh, whenever you have a missing central incisor, what happens is you can either have in the lower eyes, I mean, a spacing or the teeth will be retroclined to close the space, as we can see in this patient. And as a result of this retroclination, the patient will have an increased overjet simply because you want to close the space of this missing tooth so the teeth will be retracted so either if you have a missing lower incisors you have incisors sorry you either gonna have a spaced lower dentition or increased over budget because of the retraction of the lower incisors to close the spaces so that was so far the supernumerary hypodontia now we're gonna talk about the early loss of primary teeth as you can see here, on the right side, the molar has migrated forward, okay, as a result of a premature loss of primary E. While the one on the right side, because the E and D are there, there's no mesial migration. And this mesial migration on the right side will definitely result in a severe crowding because the five now when it's rubbed, there's no space for the five to erupt, as you can see on the OPG. So, the effect of the premature loss of primary tooth depending on, depends on three factors. Which tooth is extracted, when the tooth is extracted, and the patient's amount of crowding. So, if we have an incisor that is pre lost prematurely, either central or lateral, it has a very little impact and no compensation, no balancing extraction is required. It's just the appearance of the patient. If he's not happy with the appearance, they sometimes can make like a spoon tincture, um, acrylic teeth just to uh, close this gap. But you don't have, but orthodontically, it will not affect um, the dentition. The canine, unilateral loss of the canine, and it's an crowded arch can result in a midline shift. So basically, if you lose a canine, we said that the effect depends on when the tooth is lost which tooth is lost, and the amount of crowding. Now, the amount of crowding, as much as it increases, it increases the effect of the premature loss. So, for example, if we have mild crowding and we lost the canine on one side, we'll have a midline shift of, for example, one millimeter. If it's a moderate crowding, we're going to get three millimeter of midline shift or two millimeter. If it's severe crowding, we're going to get more than three millimeter of a midline shift. So as the in crowding increases, the severity of the malocclusion due to the premature loss will increase. So premature loss of the canine will result in a midline shift. So as you can see in this photograph, in the top photograph, we have a premature, we have a midline shift in the upper arch to the right. Okay, and it's more than three millimeter. So if you compare it to the lower midline, so that means that we have severe loss or severe drifting of the midline. And and if you can see that arch, we have severe crowding. The canine has no space to erupt on the right side. So this premature loss of the C on one side resulted on a mid midline uh, shift to the affected side. To sort out or to help to prevent this one, we have what we call it the balancing extraction. So balancing extraction is extraction of a tooth on the contralateral side to prevent the development of a midline shift. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, here it's C. We can extract the C on the other side or sometimes the D, okay, just to balance it so that we don't have a midline shift. So the only aim of the balancing extraction to prevent the midline shift. Now, losing a first a primary, secondary, losing a second primary molar, will using a mesial movement of the buccal segment, and result in a crowding, but little effect on the midline. Now, for the first primary molar, the D, because it's in the middle between the C and E, so we expect that it's gonna get a little bit of the effects of the E, little bit of the effects of the C, so it will result of mild midline shift and mesial migration of the posterior teeth, while the E will result premature loss in a mesial migration of the lower sex if the patient has severe crowding might result in a midline shift slightly but 
mainly it is a mesial migration that will result in impaction or loss of space. So if you can see here that the mesial migration of the sex due to the premature loss of the E result in a mesial migration of the sex, that the five when it erupts, it does not have enough space and become impacted. Now, usually the tooth that is affected is the last tooth to erupt because all the teeth will find their spot and the last one to erupt, they will not find space. So in the lower arch, if premature loss of the E took place, the tooth that's going to be affected is the second permanent molar second permanent premolar while if this happened in the upper arch the last tooth to eruption in the upper arch is the canine so as you can see here that we have a midline shift and the canine is affected due to the mesial migration of the buccal segment on that side and because the canine is the last tooth to erupt it erupted buccally with no enough space for this canine so far this is the lecture uh, the part one next lecture will be talking about the teeth of an odd size the variation in the tooth position and a retained primary tooth thank you